Ooh. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a good day. I think there are quite a few of you out there. I have lights in my eyes. I can't actually see anything, and I have a podium made for a hobbit. But well, I'll make it do and make it work. Um, so you're, I, I assume you're here for the ASP.NET talk about going beyond the introduction. Uh, if not, sucks to be you. Um, my name is Chris Klug. Uh, I work at a company called Active Solution in Stockholm, where we do custom software development for the Microsoft platform. Um, I've been doing Microsoft development since 1999 or something like that. It's quite a, quite a while now. Um, and um, had a special interest in ASP.NET. Actually, I started out in classical ASP. Has anybody tried programming classic ASP? OK. This is, this is cool. People, there, there are older folks in the crowd, I'm sorry to say, but you're my age now. So um, yeah. So I, I followed ASP.NET, or ASP Classic into ASP.NET and then into ASP.NET Core, and I've enjoyed doing that. I, I actually managed to become Microsoft MVP on the ASP.NET Core stack, so I get to see some of the stuff uh, from the team's point of view as well. Uh, enough about me. Time for demos. I have no more slides. Actually, I do. I have a thank you slide at the end, but that's it. Other than that, we have code. So. I want to highlight one thing about this session today, though. It terrifies me. It is really, really complicated. There are so many moving parts. I've made last-minute updates to it, uh, but I hope it's going to work. I have no idea why you're not seeing my screen, though. That, that didn't work out very well. OK, so while the crew tries to figure out why there's no, nothing on the screen, because that we can all, I can do like this. So if you all look very closely, or maybe I can get my phone up and stream it on Twitch, and you can all zoom into that or something. Um, so my machine. So, I got, so PC screen only. That is turned on right now. Actually, it, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. It went into PC screen only after. After. Oh, thank you. It, was, it wasn't his fault. It was my fault. Sorry about that. That took two minutes out of my time that I didn't have to get, get rid of. Anyhow, this is what I'm going to be working with to begin with. This is a very, very simple website about fantastic female uh, people uh, throughout history. And uh, you can go into this and have more information about Hedy, Hedy Lamar, for example. Uh, what annoys me about this little website here is this isn't very visible. I think I can do like this to show you. I dislike the, uh, the URLs up here. So it's slash user slash one, not a fantastic URL. I want to have something more SEO friendly. And that's my first thing to tackle in this project. I'm going to go and get better naming or better URLs. So I got this project here. Can everybody, see, can you in the back see this code? Cool, OK. It's a very simple MVC site. There's nothing impressive in here at all. So what we can do here is we can plug straight into the application request pipeline. I did say the talk was beyond the introduction. For some of you, this might be obvious that you can plug into the pipeline and, and modify things. For some of you, it might not be. Trust me, there will be more complex part at the end if you think this is too simple. But what we can do here is we can add a middleware in here. So we can do inline middlewares. I just need to add a I users repository for it here so I can read out my users. But the cool thing about the request pipeline that most people apparently don't understand is that the re context request object, context object or the uh, request objects in here uh, are actually read write. Lots of the properties are readable and writable. So you can go in and modify them, which means that I can quite easily go into my request pipeline and look at this and go for the path, remove the slash at the beginning have a look at the length of that. If it's only a slash, then I don't want to look at it. Otherwise, get substring one, replace, um, look at the, uh, the uh, replace the dash with a, a single quote. So basically, it looks at the name of what you're passing in. So if the path is slash grace dash, uh, who was grace? Uh, Hopper, sorry. It goes grace dash hopper, remove the, the dash between grace and hopper, figure out grace hopper's ID, and then replace the request path with users slash ID, which means that I can pass in a name, it changes the path, and when I call the next request pipeline, the next middleware, it will have the new path in there. 
And then on the way back out again, I just reset the path back to the original path, so any, any middleware coming before me will have the original path to work with. This is kind of nice because it means that I can do things like I can modify whatever request uh, I want. So basically, I can look at changing whatever URL or whatever path I want. If I go back out here, we can now change this into heady. If I get a slash in there. That, that didn't turn out very well. It's supposed to be there. Heady dash Lamar. And that works as well. So now all of a sudden, I can have nice URLs. Uh, which is cool. The only thing, if we start building our middlewares and we do this for every single middleware that we want, we're going to end up with a really ugly and complicated startup CS file. So we want to make this quite nice, or nicer at least, by adding our own custom middleware. So I'm just going to go and add a folder in here. M middlewares. Inside middlewares, I'm going to add a new class. Class is going to be called name routing middleware. I'm going to replace that. I only work for clients that need stuff I already have snippets for. <laughs> Makes life much easier. I, I can charge for an hour, and it took me three seconds to do. Fantastic work. So this is a middleware. If you haven't seen one before, they're quite cool. They're a class. They don't need to inherit from anything. They don't need to implement any interface or anything like that. It's just a class, and it has to have a method called invoke async, returning a task, and accepting an HTTP context. That's it. That makes it a, uh, a middleware. It also supports uh, dependency injection, so I can always go and say I users and get my users repository passed in, like that. Then I can go back out here, and I can take all of this code here, cut that out of here, paste it into my invoke async method, replace this little call here for next. So what we do with await next is basically, when we call await next, it's going to send the request on through the pipeline for any other middleware downstream. And then when it comes back up, this thing here is going to be after all the other middlewares have executed. So this is on the way back out again. So I get that in there, and all of a sudden I can make this a little bit nicer by having dot use middleware. I can go name routing middleware. Missing a letter here, missing quite a few stuff here. Middleware using like that. Looks a little bit better, right? Uh, than having that whole chunk of code, which then turns into more chunks of code, which turns into lots of chunks of code, and then all of a sudden your startup CS file is, is long, uh, thousands of rows, which is just not fantastic. However, if you're used to working with ASP.NET Core, you know that we have these use static files, use routing. Looks much, much nicer than use middleware of T, blah, 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 which is quite easy to fix as well for me. So another class going middleware extensions, extensions. It's hard to see up here. There it is. And for middleware extensions, I'm going to do, it's going to be an extension method, so it needs to be a static class. Doesn't spell like that, static class. And then I can add this simple helper method here that's called name routing, use name routing. Use name routing is an extension on iApplication Builder, and it just calls that same use middleware call that I had previously. Now, it's very tempting to go in here and say, I'm going to just going to go control dot and add a using for a Microsoft ASP.NET Core Builder. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to go and I'm going to change my namespace here to Microsoft, Microsoft.ASP.NETCore.Builder. And then I'm going to add a using statement for my own middleware instead, like that. And the reason for inverting that and using Microsoft's namespace is that I know that the Microsoft ASP.NET Core Builder namespace is going to be used inside of the start, or you have a using statement inside of startup.cs already because, well, I am using the iApplication Builder in here, which means that anybody pulling in my class will automatically have use name routing without having to add in extra using statements to get the extension method to work like that. So if I run this, we should have 
pretty much the same thing I had before. I can go in here, I can go to this tab here, I can refresh Hedy Lamar, and I got Hedy Lamar, and if I change Hedy Lamar to some other fantastic woman, like Grace Hopper, um, that works as well, and I get Grace Hopper, fine. There's a little problem with this code, though. Uh, the astute attendee here might have f figured out that if I go back and I point at one of these things here, you can't quite see it, but in the down left corner here it says slash user slash one. So since I'm only rewriting the URLs or the paths coming in, then all of my existing URLs or paths are going to be wrong, right? So all links are going to point to the wrong place, and I could fix that. I could go into my code and I could replace all of these places and go and say this is going to be slash Grace Hopper, slash Hedy Lamar, and so on. Or I can hack it. I want to have a massive caveat about what I'm supposed to do, I'm doing now, and that is please do not do this. It is a demo. It works fine for smaller things. If you go home and you put it into your web application that has hundreds of thousands of users, I'm going to bring, or you, sorry, you are going to bring down your server to its knees. That's just the way it works. But I want to show the demo anyway because it shows what the pot potential we have in using middlewares. So if I go in here and I go right before the name routing middleware, uh, I can go and say, BTI, let's pull in another middleware here. Here's another cool thing. So. Even the response.body is writable. I can actually go in and create a new memory stream, replace response.body with my memory stream, save a reference to the response.body, the real memory, the real stream, ask the rest of the middlewares to do their things, and they will write to response.body and push all their stuff to that stream, but they're pushing it to my memory stream. <laughs> I've stolen your stream. Which means that when I get back down here, instead of just returning what they gave me back, I can go and say, hey, let me add some code in here where I will take whatever thing you had put into my stream, make it a string, then for each one of the uh, users in my users repo, or actually I, I look at the regex and I see, is there anything inside of this string that contains slash user slash and an ID? In that case, I go in here and I say, for each one of the users, go in and replace slash user slash ID with slash user dot first name and user dot last name instead. Basically, rewriting every single URL going to user slash ID on the way out. This is really cool because it means that if I build this, that was not what I wanted to press. If I build this, and I run this application in my, my browser here, and I refresh this, and I point at this thing down here, it now says slash Hedy Lamar. So now I am fixing my broken application by fixing my URLs on the way out and rewriting them on the way in. So I'm still calling the same endpoint in MVC, which is slash user slash ID, but I've rewritten everything on the way out. Fantastic. But Chris, are you stupid? Yes, at the moment I am. Because you're creating a memory stream for every single incoming request, you're doing a regular expression over that text that comes back, which might be massive because it might be a big page, and then you do a fantastic for each loop, looping over every single user in your database and doing replace for each one of them. Isn't that slow? Yes, it's massively slow. As I said, it will kill your web server, but it works. We can fix that a little bit by adding some optimistic Really simple caching. Once again, please do not replicate this in your production system. It's a demo to show what you can do. So what we're going to do in here, so I'm just going to follow along here so I know what I'm doing. I am going to pull in an I -distrib -d distributed cache. So the I distributed cache is a service that is always available in ASP.NET Core by default. It's not distributed by default even though it's called iDistributed Cache. It's an in-memory cache until you reconfigure it to be a Redis cache or something like that, but it's always there. So I can always take a dependency on that. Once I have that dependency, let's go in here before my rewrites and add this little thing here. So I'm going to add another middleware in here. Look at the cache, trying to get anything out of the cache based on the path that I passed in. So basically, I'm caching per path, the way you do response caching. If there's something in the cache, I, respond, I return that, and I just return here, which means that I'm short-circuiting the whole request pipeline. 
by pulling it out of the cache. If it's not in the cache, I call the next to basically carry on with the request. On the way coming back, it looks and says, did somebody add an uh, add to cache uh, to the items uh, array or items dictionary? In that case, please add it to the cache, whatever bytes are in that value, add that to the cache. And for the future, you can, we will use the cache instead. And it adds a 10 minute timeout for my cache. Very, very basic cache. All I need to do is go in here. If I have made a change in here, I'm going to go ctx.items add to cache equals bytes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that I was trying to be funny. There it is, bytes. Cool thing about this, if I put a breakpoint in here now, put a breakpoint there, do F5, do some debugging. Comes in here, comes in here, comes in here to my request, fine, no worries, carry on, do your thing, get the response back. If I refresh this page, you can now see that my cache is picking up the request. So, I'm not saying that you should be caching like this. There are better cache caching models, but it's really cool to see how quickly and how easily you can plug into your request pipeline to do things like replacements, adding cache, adding things. The only thing you need to know is your iApp configuration is a pipeline. Stuff will come in, it will go through one middleware after another, and somewhere in there you can go in and do whatever you want, and then you await what's going on in the next one, and when it comes back, you can respond to the outgoing stuff. So has any of you, I assume most of you have used the, uh, uh, what's it called, the um, error, error handling middleware or something like that, error, use error handling something. It, it does that. It literally, when the request comes in, it does a try catch around a wait next. And in the catch, it knows that some, some middleware further down the line has thrown an exception. It is bubbled up through the request, and it comes up to that middleware, and that middleware catches it and sends out a response back. Very, very simple. I thought it was a magical middleware, and it, it did, a, did a bunch of really complicated things. Yes, it does a try-catch. If you find that complicated, by the way, doing a try-catch, I would recommend not staying in the session because I'm about to do some really weird things that I have a hard time explaining how they work, but they do. Okay, so we live in an API first world, right? So obviously my very, very advanced awesome source company website has to have an API. Obviously I have to go and fetch information about these fantastic women using an API. So I have an API here. Uh, you can see here localhost 44302 slash API slash user slash one. A weird flickering. Send that, it goes off, and I get some JSON back. Awesome, right? Well, JSON is fine, but I also remember that you should be able to go to your headers and add an accept header with text XML, and you should get XML back, right? This is awesome. I add that accept header, I press send, and I get JSON back. This is a change from MVC to, to uh, or ASP.NET Core MVC compared to the old ASP.NET MVC, because they had that feature built in. It is actually built in, it's just that nobody really uses it because apparently XML is not the flavor of the month. YAML is, which is way worse than XML in every single way. Um, but what we can do is we can go into add controllers with views, and we can add this callback. They have something called output formatters. So output formatters are responsible for, what do you think? Formatting output, named very wisely. What we can do is just go output formatters.add and then new XML serializer format, uh, uh, XML serializer output formatter. I have not spelled that right. I actually spell it right. Okay, just add one of those to your, your application. Very simple, add another formatter. That formatter knows all about how to do XML formatting for outputting things. So if I go back out here and I press send, ta-da, it's XML. So all of you that are older than 25, you're going to fall all in love with being able to use XML once again. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, but 
APIs often have one more little feature that they, we need to figure out when building web APIs, and that is how do we do versioning? Because it's, it's all fun and games with APIs when you build version one, and then you come back and you go, oh, I need to make some changes to my API. Oh, all changes need to be 100% backwards compatible for existing clients, and you sit in the corner and you cry for a while because you had all these grand ideas of how to change it. Well, this whole thing with the accept header is built into to HTML or HTTP. So with HTTP, uh, we, we already have this idea of I can ask for different things. I can ask for text XML or I can ask for application JSON. I get different responses. What if we could do that for versioning? Well, you can, which is really, really awesome. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go into my controllers, into my API. I'm going to add another folder in here. Uh, new folder. Uh, models. Chris, we don't put models in the controllers folder. Yes, we do when I'm on stage. So I'm going to say I'm going to have basic user, basic user, which is going to be just imagine. Just it's a stupid example I know, but let's try and imagine that I have this idea where I don't want to return a full user in my API. I want to have a smaller subset of, of properties, which I call a, a basic user. So I create this stupid DTO, which basically removes some of the properties, allowing me to only pass back ID, last, first name, and last name. But I still build it off the, the original user object. But you can imagine this being something completely different. It was just the simplest way to demo this. So I have this basic user, and I want to go ahead and I want to create an, a controller for that. So I'm going to create a new, nope. I'm going to go and create a new user, not a new controller. I'm going to add a new action in here. Um, like that. So I'm going to create another action here called get basic user. Uh, it's going to return a basic user. Uh, and it's going to have the address slash user ID, which is exactly the same as the other one, which is obviously going to fail. Because if you run this, it's going to throw a, a duplicate endpoint exception or something weird like that, which isn't going to work. So the way, how do I differentiate between this new fandangled v2 version of my API versus the old one? Well, that's where the accept header comes in. And we can quite easily fix this and make it work by adding, I'm just going to add a little folder here to stuff my code in. I'm going to add an infrastructure file or folder. It's kind of like having that misc folder uh, that you put everything in that you don't know where it, where it belongs, that shouldn't be in your project to begin with because you don't know where it belongs. So I'm going to have infrastructure. I'm going to add a, something called an accept header attribute. And I'm going to implement that like this. So I am creating a class called accept header attribute, which is inherits from attributes, so I can add it as an attribute. There's a lot of attributes in that, that statement. Uh, and it implements I action um, constraint. So the I action constraint method, or I, sorry, interface, defines a single method called accept and a property called order. We're going to ignore order because it doesn't matter. I'm just going to have one on each hit anyway, so the order doesn't matter. But the accept method takes a context and returns bool. And if you return false from that boolean, it says, no, this action is not relevant for this request. If it returns yes, it says, yes, this action is relevant for this request. So what I can, in this case, I just look at the, the route context, HP context, request headers, look at the accept headers, saying, is there any accept header that starts with whatever I have passed in here? Taking that accept header attribute, adding it to my, my method here, accept header, I can pass in my accept header, and there is a sort of defined standard that says you will use application application slash vnd for vendor dot user for the type that I want. So if I use the accept header application vnd user, I should now get this method instead. If I run this, if I go back out here, we remove that thing again, we send this request, I get the old one. And if I add vnd dot user and I send that request, I now get, did I spell that wrong? Thank you for the heads up before I ran the code. Let's try it again. I get the short version. 
sweet, now I could have other things than VND user. I could have VND user 1.0, 2.0. You can now have the same endpoint returning different things depending on the accept header. I could return an image. I could return different versions of a user and such and such. And if it's HTML, I return an HTML page. If it's text, I return the information. If it's blah, 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 I can do whatever I want. Really, really cool. However, now it only returns JSON. So a very common thing that we do is that we have this thing where we, we have a format which is VND user plus XML saying that I want the application VND user type, but can you please return it as XML instead? That doesn't work. Uh, it, it blatantly just fails completely in all different ways. Uh, so what we need to do is figure out how to return that. And that's actually, I wouldn't say easy. Uh, it's quite easy if you know what you're doing and if you've spent way too much time on the Microsoft Docs. But you go to the create a new class here, and you call the class accept header output formatter selector. I think I spelled that right, except for the H being lowercase, but it was that and that one. Let's just ignore the fact that it was lowercase. Um, and I'm going to replace that with BTI 11. That was 10. No, that was 10, that one, sorry. So an output formatter selector inherits from output formatter selector, which is an ASP.NET core type. And it has a method that you can override called select formatter, which is basically, please tell me which formatter I should use for this request. It's all we need to implement. And the way that we can implement that, well, first of all, I need a constructor, because I need some helper things. So first of all, I'm going to create a constructor here, which accepts an MVC options, which is actually what you put in basically this object here. So that's going to get injected in here, and I get an iLogger factory for logging. And I go ahead and I create a fallback selector, which is based on the default output formatter selector that ASP.NET Core uses by default. So I store that in case I don't know how to figure out how to do it, I'll just fall back to the default. And I, create a, I keep a list of the output formatters that have been defined in my options. So all I need. Then we can go ahead and say, implement this thing here. So the first thing I do in the get header, select formatter, I look at the headers and see, is there an accept header that starts with application slash VND? If not, then give it to the default format, output selector formatter, output selector. I don't, really don't care. Just not my problem. Go and figure it out. Otherwise, I get the content type that I want to use for my accept header. I'll show that in a second. I rewrite the content type on my context to that thing that I've decided to use instead. Then I ask the formatter collection, is there any one of you that can actually render a response based on this formatting type or this type? And then I set the content type back and I return the formatter that says, yes, I can, I can uh, serialize this for you. This con get content type from uh, hand accept header looks like this. It's very simple. It, it looks at the headers to accept. If there's a plus inside the accept header, it means that I have an application vnd.user plus XML. I cut off the end of it based on the, the plus, so anything after the plus gets cut off. I map whatever is put behind the, the plus against this lit dictionary here, saying if you add plus JSON, then the type is going to be application JSON. XML is text XML. And that means that when I pass it in here, it cuts that off changes the content type to be the, like the, the correct MIME type, and then it basically switches the content type back to the application VND user thing once it's done. With that code in place, I can figure out how to do that. I can go out here. We'll do services dot add singleton, and we'll do output format selector. That was not me. I just want to make that very, very clear. Was not me. And then I'm going to use my version here. So I'm going to use the accept header formatter selector. Accept header formatter, sorry, output, output formatter selector. That's the world's longest output formatter selector using that one. So I'm basically replacing the one that ASP.NET Core is putting in there by default. If I run this, 
go back to Insomnia, I can now say, can you please give me the simpler version in XML? Or can you give me the simpler version in JSON? Or can you give me the full version in JSON? Or can you give me the full version in XML? Versioning with content negotiation built in, which is really, really awesome. OK, what else can we do? Well, if we look at this uh, controller I've got here, there's a little thing that annoys me. Actually, it doesn't, but I had to make up a reason for doing this. It obviously annoys me a whole lot that I have to do users .where ID, user ID, or where ID is in twice here. We don't want to repeat our code twice, right? What, wouldn't it be nice if we could say user, and if I get the user passed in, I don't actually need that object, which means I'm dot not doing anything async anymore, so I can actually simplify it down to this. Much nicer. We can do the same thing here. We'll do user, user, unasync it, remove the user object here. That, that would be nice, right? Plain, simple, I get the object instead of getting the ID, having to look it up, kind of annoying. And we can, we can sort this out quite easily. Once again, go add class. I am going to add a user model binder. I'm going to create an implementation of that that looks like this. So an, a model binder implements iModelBinder. All it really has to do is implement this one thing called bind model async. It gets some form of context, returns task. Inside this, I need to figure out how to bind whatever into whatever. So in this case, whatever into whatever, this is a really crappy explanation, but it's kind of like the, the requirements I get from, from customers. Um, I'm going to start off by checking if the binding context is null. In that case, uh, I throw an exception. Then I look at the binding context .model metadata name. That thing contains the name of the property or the parameter that I am trying to model bind. So in this case, it is going to contain the string user. Then I take the user and I add an ID at the end, assuming that somebody is going to pass a user ID value through a post or a get as a query string parameter or something like that. So I asked the value provider, can you please get me a value passed from the user, which is called user ID? If there isn't one, then <clears throat> something went wrong, just I'm not interested. I'm not going to model bind this for you. Go and do something else. But if you're giving me a value, I will pull out the first value. Once again, check, is it null or empty? If it is, then return. Otherwise, use the value that I got out of that, which is going to be my user ID. Try and get an integer out of that. If that fails, add a model state exception and, and return because somebody has passed in user ID ABC, which is not valid, so throw an exception. And it actually returns a proper error message in the, the response. Otherwise, find the user based on the ID and set the bind model binding result to success. That's kind of cool. That can then be used inside my controller to say this, sh this here should be using that model binder. or I can go and add another class in here called a model binder provider. So I'm going to add a new class. It's going to be called user model binder provider. It's getting kind of Java esque now. Uh, it's going to be some form of factory thing you know, in there in, at some point. But so it looks like that. So it's an iModel binder provider. What's its only responsibility is to look at the request and say, can you give me a model binder for this? So basically what I do is, are you trying to model bind to user? If not, not my problem. If that is the case, please use this model binder here. Why am I adding it in a binder type model binder type of... So that extra one, you have to return new something. And the binder type model binder gives us dependency injection. So it's basically a, a, a model binder of something else that generates an instance which has dependency injection. It, it, it works. Just leave it at that. So it creates an instance of my model binder. So now I have my model binder and the model binder provider. I can now go into my cleaning up here. In here, we can say options dot model binder providers. And you would think you can do add, but you can't. Because it does it in order, so it goes from top to bottom. And the default one that's in there says, I can do it all. 
So you have to go insert instead. So we're going to do insert at zero. New uh, user model binder provider, like that. So that's adding my model binder provider in there. If I run this, but I want to run this, I just closed the wrong thing. If I run this and I put a breakpoint in there, press F5. Actually, this is not even what I'm waiting for. We should go over here. Sorry. Uh, if I run this now and I do send, that jumps straight in here. And look at that. My user is now bound to an instance of and this services entities user. So I don't need to do that lookup. That's been done in the model binder for me instead. Awesome stuff. There is a little caveat. If you read the docs for it, it says you should never do what I just did. Uh, don't run off to the database in the model binder. It is meant to basically take a complex type that you send from the client and basically take that complex type and turn it into a class. It's not supposed to be you send an ID and I run off to the database because there's a ton of errors that can happen when you run to the database and not all of them are great in a model binder, to be perfectly honest. So all of the demos I've shown you so far, they're really cool. Please don't do them again at home. We, we agree on that? Now, some of it you can do, and this works. I just want to, for my MVP's sake, I don't want to get thrown out of the, uh, the program just because I'm telling you to do things you shouldn't do. I want to have the caveat in there that somebody smarter than me has decided that you shouldn't do what I just did. So I have another demo here. I have more demos. Uh, let's go into my other fantastic project. Uh, let's do set a starter project. That's the one. This is the uh, Enterprise Employee Management Inc. I, I'm never going to start a company on my own, that's for sure, because I have no idea what to do. So it has a little login here. I log in as a Grace. I think that's the password. Yes, it is. And in here, uh, I have John Doe, who is dead weight. Uh, I can add a profile picture in here. The problem with profile pictures is that they need to be resized and things like that, which can be a heavy operation and so on. So I want to do that asynchronously in the background. I want this to return quickly without me having to wait for the picture to be resized and things like that. Doing things in the background in ASP.NET Core can be a bit of a hassle, but with this, it's actually not that hard anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a new folder in here. I'm going to call it... How about infrastructure? Infrastructure. That looks good. Inside my infrastructure folder, I'm going to go ahead and add a class called a thumbnail generator. Thumbnail generator. That looks good. And I am going to go ahead and implement something called an iHosted service. It's a built-in ASP.NET Core feature. Don't see a lot of people using it. It has this cool thing, start async, stop async. When your app starts, it starts. When it stops, it stops. Can't be much simpler than that. So inside of this, in start async here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say BTI 18. I'm going to, nope, sorry, I need a constructor first. That one. So I'm going to have a constructor that just gets an iWeb host environment, so I get some information about the hosting. I'm going to have some employees, which is just a, a repo with employees. I'm going to have a file system watcher at some point. Now I can go ahead and implement my start async. So in start async, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a path combined web root images backslash backslash employees. So basically, www root uh, images employees, any images will be placed in there. I'm going to go ahead and create the directory if it doesn't exist creating a file system watcher that watches for any files being placed inside of that folder. Whenever a file is created in that folder, stuff happens, and that's it. That's all it's going to do. So I'm going to sit there and listen for events. Um, so what's the whole uh, stuff happens? Well, stuff is this. Lots of code. But it basically it looks at the file name, and if it contains thumb, it shouldn't do any because it's already a thumbnail. But other than that, I'm naming the file so that the information about the tenant and the user ID and things like that is in the name, so I can figure it out from the naming standard or naming convention. Then I pull out the user with that employee ID from the name. Then I create a new image in here. That needs a fantastic little, oops, I need network connection. There should be networks available. Should be one called NDC, I think. At the top. Was it at the top? There it is. Thank you. 
Uh, so I need a NuGet package for that. Please connect. There it is. So we're going to go manage NuGet packages. Going to add a NuGet package called uh, Image Sharp. That one. And I am going to add that one, the six labors Image Sharp. Add that. Uh, accept. Ignore the errors down at the bottom. They are there for a future demo. Then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say this image here comes out of six labors image sharp. And this thing here is an extension method from image sharp. What it does, it resizes my image and, and saves it as dash thumb. That's what it does. Nothing complicated at all. Uh, and there's an ugly exception at the bottom, or a, a thing at the bottom where sometimes the file is created, and if it's big, it hasn't released the file before this gets executed. So if that happens, then just run the code again. If there's any other error that happens to be there, I'm just going to run for an eternal loop and basically bring the web server to its knees. But once again, it's a demo. It works. Um, and then in my stop async, I'm going to go ahead and say, when that the web application is stopped, then stop listening for file changes, turn off the uh, file system watcher, and dispose the file system watcher. That's about it. If I go ahead and I add a breakpoint there, and I press F5, <laughs> and for some reason, I'm not very religious. Actually, I'm not religious at all, but praying comes natural when you press F5 at the demo with people in the room. Just happens to be like that. So I go in here, I go add profile picture. I cho cho choose a file here. So we go Chris, upload. Why did directory not found? Oh, no, no, sorry. I missed a thing. I missed a step. That's why I have the iPad. It tells me what steps to do. Sorry, it needs to be added to my, sorry, services.add hosted service. I need to add it in here, of course, to tell um, generator, tell MVC, or sorry, .NET that it exists. So I'm going to add thumbnail generator like that. Sorry, let's try that again. Maybe. Here it is. Maybe. There it is. Well, let's try it again. Add profile picture, choose file. Chris.png, upload. Here it is. It comes in. It finds the file being, uh, being there. So I just run through that, let it run. Go back out here. Notice that this thing is still running in the background. I already got the response back from ASP.NET Core because it has already just saved the file and given me a response back. The whole thumbnail generation is on the background thread, which is kind of cool. I let this go again because it comes in a second time for the thumbnail. And if I refresh this thing here now, there is a picture of me. So basically, it runs in the background asynchronously. It doesn't block anything while it changes the size of the image and things like that. So that's kind of neat. I kind of like that. Now, I have, I think, 18 more minutes. And I'm now going to do one of those, I wish I didn't have this idea when I built this talk kind of demos. So how many of you use uh, Azure? How many of you have gone into an Azure web application and checked the little checkbox that says, add application insights to your, your application? How many of you have thought, how do they add application insights to my code with a checkbox? Not a single hand, or a few, few little hands. OK, that was my thought. I'm like, how do they get their code in my code without asking me? Because I need to learn how to do that. So I want to show you how to do a couple of things about deploying to servers, which is kind of cool. And they all sort of, the, the culmination is I can inject stuff into any application that is launched on my machine, which is really, really cool. So deploy anything to my laptop, and I will put my grabby hands on your code, and I will inject stuff into it, and I will do stuff you don't want to know to your code. So the first step of that is using something called a runtime store. Runtime stores used to be a thing. They're not a big thing anymore because they changed the way that .NET Core works. But a runtime store, I have a little class library here. Or actually, it's not a class library. It's, an, it's a console app. doesn't matter. It's a project. Uh, I'm not going to use that project. The only thing I want from that project is this csproj file. And the csproj file says, I have a reference to these four NuGet packages, which happens to be the same NuGet packages used by the Enterprise Employee uh, Management Inc. application. 
So I have this in place here, same references. I have a little thing here that references a NuGet package in a debug folder one level up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this request diagnostics package. Just going to build that to make sure that there is a NuGet package. So if I expand this now, this thing generates a NuGet package for me. In the bin debug, there is a NuGet package, or a NUP keg, that some, like some people call it. Um, that's all I want. That's all I'm going to use the CS project file for. It is to reference the NuGet packages. With that in place, I'm going to go ahead and run a, an arcane compand in, in here. I'm going to say .NET store. Can you guys see that in the back? No. Let's zoom. Can you see that? Cool. If I press F8, I'm going to get that. So a new .NET store takes what's called a manifest, which is a CS project file that references other NuGet packages like my proj file. Then I tell it that I want to create a runtime store that's going to contain these assemblies that I can put somewhere on a machine so that other people can use it. You can see it. I'm going to swear now in church, I'm well aware of it. You can see it kind of like a global assembly cache. Ooh. But you control it, and it's nothing like a global assembly cache at all. But it's a way for us to deploy assemblies to a machine and have applications on that machine be able to be deployed without those assemblies and use the pre-deployed ones on the machine, which means that if you have a lot of assemblies that you need for your deployment, you can go and say, preload these on the server and just deploy the things I've changed. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining the runtime store containing my four NuGet packages, and I'm saying set it up for Win 10 x64, put the runtime store at C colon demo, and skip optimization. I used to say in my demo that I don't know what that does. I'm going to say that again. I have no idea what that one does, but if you don't add it, the whole thing blows up in your face with a massive error, and if you Google it, it says add skip optimization, you're good. So I added skip optimization. What this does is if we go explorer, c colon demo backslash runtime store, this, uh, oh, this is going to be hard for you to see. I'm sorry about that. But in here, it basically creates an x64 folder, net 5.0 folder, and one folder for each one of the NuGet packages that I had a reference to, if I zoom in like that. And a, a, an artifact.xml file. So if I take that artifact.xml file and I add that to my project here, we can see here, it basically just says that in this runtime store, you will find these assemblies. OK, that's kind of simple. Don't mind that too much. Next step, go back into the console, clear the console. And then inside here, let's go ahead and say .NET publish. And since I'm, I'm, I type really poorly, I'm going to use that one. So I'm going to do a .NET publish of my Enterprise Employee Management Inc. project, do a release build, and publish it to C colon demo publish folder. Run that. Run that. There it is. We'll do the Explorer thing again. But in this, ca in this case, I won't go to that folder. I will actually go to this folder here, the publish folder, and you don't need to see what's in here as such, but what I can tell you is there's a bcrypt.net core, there's a Newton soft, there's a six labors image sharp. Yeah, it's what you expect from a project like this, because that was what I had referenced. If I go out here, and let's go ahead and just kill that publish folder completely, just delete it, we want, yep, like that. Then we go, I shouldn't have closed that. Let's do .NET publish again. But this time, I'm going to add this extra parameter called dash dash manifest, and I'm going to point it towards my artifact XML file that says, this runtime store is already available on the machine, so anything inside of that you don't need to bring on your own. Build my application again. And all of a sudden, in my publish folder, all of those assemblies are now gone, and they don't need to be redeployed because they're already on my machine. Sweet, faster deployment, no worries. Ish. The next step happens to be that you have to add a little environment variable for this to work. So let's go ahead and add that environment variable. I just need to figure out that I spelled this correctly. So it's going to be, actually, we can start out by this first. Let's do cd publish. Let's do .NET enterprise application thingy. 
that thing, run that, and it says, who cannot find bcrypt.net? No, it can't, because there is a runtime store on my machine. I said it was like the GAC, but it's nothing like the GAC. It doesn't know that it exists. I actually have to tell it that if you, there is a runtime store, and here is the runtime store for you. So the way we tell it that there is a runtime store is by adding an environment variable called .NET shared, and I think I've got that programmed as well, shared store. And I give it the address of my runtime store, press enter. That's now an environment variable in my machine or in this terminal. And if I run my .NET command again, it will now run the application without a problem because even though the file is not in, the assembly is not in the bin folder of that application, it knows that there is an environment variable that tells it that there are assemblies in my runtime store, which is located over here, so it loads those things as well. Nobody's going to use this, but it's kind of cool. So let's take this for a, a, a further, <laughs> further trip down the rabbit hole, because uh, I'm going to make this worse. Uh, I want to do the whole, I want to put my grabby hands on your code and inject stuff into what you're running. How do we do that? Well, let's see. There are many steps here, and so far I don't think I've managed to do this demo once without it failing at least once for me. So please bear in mind that when I, when I fail with this. I have a little request diagnostics project here. It has an, a diagnostics log implementing iDiagnostics log. It's a really stupid log, and it once again, it will bring down your web server if you actually use it, but for the demo, it works. It basically looks at every single incoming request. Uh, sorry, this, next part. This part here will just store every single log entry as a list, and whenever the application is stopping, uh, so I can do the application lifetime, application stopping, I go and say file, write all text to basically store the, the log entries into a TXT file. So when I start up the application next time, it reads up all the, the log entries into memory. So over time, I'm going to fill up your memory with log statements. Once again, it's a demo. So that's all that log does. And then I have a diagnostics middleware which is a middleware that I can plug into a request pipeline. It logs every single incoming request into my uh, diagnostics log. And if you go to slash diagnostics, I will go and basically circumvent your whole request pipeline and go and return these log statements so you can see them in the web browser as well. Th that's all the code I have. And I need this injected into your code or the application code running on my machine. And the way we do that is a two-step program. First of all, I'm going to go and add a new class in here. I'm going to add a class in here. I'm going to call it a hosting, no, sorry, diagnostics. Uh, the one I want is a startup filter. Diagnostic startup filter like that. And I'm going to replace that with this thing here. So a diagnostic startup filter is a class implementing iStartupFilter. And the iStartup filter allows you to get access to the iApplication builder, so basically the request pipeline. By adding any class implementing iStartup filter into your, the, into your CI container, or sorry, DI container, so basically into your services, it will automatically be executed when your application starts up. So ASP.NET Core goes in and looks at every single registered class in the DI container and says, is there anything that implements iStartup filter? Then run this code. Cool. In my code, I add my diagnostics middleware. So basically, I, if I put this into DI, into an application, it will inject my middleware into the request pipeline. The next part of this is to add another class. There it is. I'm going to go and say add. I'm going to add another type of class, which is going to be called diagnostics hosting startup. Once again, I'm just going to replace that so you can see the code. So a diagnostic, so iHosting Startup is a class that implements iHosting Startup, but instead of plugging into your application request pipeline, it actually plugs into the creation of your web host builder. During your web host building, you get access to the services. So using this thing here, I can go and add my iStartup filter, diagnostic startup filter, to the DI service. And then that thing runs and attaches to your request pipeline. And to be able to get this to work, I also need to add a little assembly attribute here saying that this assembly contains a hosting startup that needs to be executed. And here is the class that implements the iHosting startup. With those two things in place, I have everything that I need to jack myself into my code. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to go and I already have a NuGet package version 1.0.0. 0. 0. 
So to get this to work, I have to go and change the version of this NuGet package to 1.0.1. Might be more than a 0 0.01 update, but it's, you get it. It needs a new version, that's all I need. Then I'm going to build this thing to make sure that I get a NuGet package. Let's see if I get a NuGet package called one here. So bin debug. There's a 0 0.1 package version of it now. That's good. This thing here, my store, has a reference to 1.0.star, so that's happy-go-lucky. So I'm just going to rebuild this to make sure that it creates, gets the NuGet package needed, so, and so on. And then I can go back out here, and I can recreate my store with .NET store. .NET store, like that. So I'm just going to recreate my store to get my version 1.0.1 .1 into my runtime store as well with a new version. The next part is the one that's kind of hard to explain, but when you build a web application, or sorry, build a .NET Core application, you get this fantastic file. So I'm going to go and say, open that out. I'm going to go to my bin folder, debug folder, net5. You get something called a depths.json file. The depths.json file tells the runtime that when you load this assembly, you need to load these other assemblies as well. So these are, this is my dependency list. So I'm going to take this, this version here, because it contains everything needed to run my NuGet packages. And I'm going to go and say, you don't need to load the runtime store. So I'm going to remove the runtime store from the libraries that needs to be loaded, like that. Save that file again. Go back out here, and I'm going to copy that file. So I'm copying that file, the, uh, the runtime store.deps.json, into a folder underneath shared Microsoft ASP.NET Core app 500 diagnostics.deps.json. Copying that file across, it's a file. That means that there now is a file on disk called uh, diagnostics.deps.json in a very specific location, which is underneath shared Microsoft ASP.NET Core 5. Um, with that in place, I can now go ahead in here, and I'm going to add two more environment variables. I'm going to add one called .NET additional depths. That says that when you load an assembly on this machine, there will potentially be an additional dependencies that you need to load as well. And it's going to load it based on the fact that my application inherits from or builds on top of AS Microsoft .NET Core ASP.NET, sorry, Microsoft ASP.NET Core 500. So any application on my machine right now built using ASP.NET Core 500 will also go and load the additional dependencies from that depths folder, depths file located in my additional dependencies. The next part is I can go ahead and add a, an environment variable here, and it's going to be called ASP.NET. It's going to be ASP.NET Core Hosting Startup Assemblies saying that there is an assembly, hosting startup assembly called request diagnostics that should be loaded whenever you start an application like that. Add that as well. .NET. Nope, that is not going to work. We need to run that. You see that output here, adding generic diagnostics to system? So what happens when I run this, X, this, this DLL, what happens is that since there is an environment variable with this um, additional depths kind thing here, it's going to go and say, OK, there are additional dependencies. I'm going to go and look for those. And it looks, what am I basing this application off of? Well, that's ASP.NET Core 5. Is there a folder called shared slash Microsoft ASP.NET Core slash 500? Yes, there is. Take the depths.json file in there, find out those dependencies, and load them in as well. Loading those assemblies in means loading in my, my diagnostics NuGet package, the six labors NuGet package, and a few other NuGet packages that was in that store as well. Um, and now it notes that those needs to be loaded into memory as well. Then ASP.NET Core starts up and starts running the application. It says, oh, there is an ASP.NET Core hosting startup assemblies environment variable saying that there is an assembly called request diagnostics that contains a hosting startup thing. So it goes and says, have I loaded a, an, an assembly called request diagnostics? Yes, I have. Does that thing include an assembly attribute for hosting startup? Yes, it does. It's this one. And then it loads that, which runs throughout the web host, application, web host setup. That injects 
things into the DI, the DI container, and then during startup, it goes to the DI container and asks for the hosting, the, the startup thingy, the uh, I startup filter, and lets that play with the request pipeline. And the result of that is that if I go over to my browser and I browse to localhost 5001, that is my application. If I request that a couple of times, and then go and say, can I go to slash diagnostics? There is my diagnostics file. And if I go ahead and I cancel this, and I do explorer dot, you will see that there is a diagnostics log file that has all of my requests being in there. So all that needs to be done now is any application on my machine launched in that terminal will automatically have my diagnostics log and my diagnostics endpoint for me to work with. And I could add these as global environment variables that would work for everything on my entire server, for example. So anything deployed to your server at work would automatically get a bunch of stuff injected into your application by default. That, my friends, was one hour of really weird ASP.NET Core knowledge. I'm sorry about that if it didn't make any sense to you. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, I will be around. I, I'm on Twitter if you want to tweet me, complain about something, or say thank you for a great presentation. Don't forget, if you like the session, please eval it. If you didn't like the session, there's a bowl out there on the left-hand side. Go to the right-hand side, please. Leave room for the people who like the session. Thanks.